We are now joined by a very special guest. He is the Virginia men's lacrosse head coach, Lars Tiffany. And Lars, first and foremost, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, it's good to spend the morning with you, Owen and Johnny. Uh, thanks for having me on. We are uh, excited to, to have a guest like you on and, and myself as a Liverpool guy, Central New York native, always excited to bring on a fellow Central New York native. Mm -hmm. So we'll start with there. Obviously, we were just talking before we came on about the snow going on right now, but outside of the snow, what is maybe your most underrated or favorite aspect of Central New York? Well, I mean, I grew up in Lafayette, New York. I grew up bleeding the orange of the Orangemen. And I, I think what I always loved was how important Syracuse sports was. I, you know, I, I was 12 years old or going to the basketball camp, Jim Beheim's basketball camp. And I uh, remember walking by the uh, construction of the Carrier Dome. Uh, I went to football games at Archibald Stadium with my dad, you know, pre-Carrier Dome. Um, my, uh, the basketball team came to my dad's restaurant several times. My dad uh, owned the Scotch and Sirloin. And, um, and just going to lacrosse games and football games and basketball games and everything Syracuse, that to me is, it's a sports town. It's a t city that really cares about lacrosse and the other sports. And that's what's really cool for us lacrosse guys. You know, it's, we're, you know, we, we, we're not on the bottom of the totem pole, but we're not at the totem top of the totem pole when you look at college sports nationally. But when you when we're playing Syracuse, there's 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 more interest, there's more attention because of the student body of Syracuse University, because of the local fan base, and um, that's what I think I, I I really appreciated growing up is how big of a deal Syracuse sports is, and uh, um, and so I, I love it. You know, it is it's um, you know, and how the whole town rallies around the rallies around the university. Coach, so as you know, we roll full steam ahead here towards the postseason. Obviously, it's a year that you know the ACC is is potentially loaded as ever. We've heard all about it. You guys come in technically as the defending national champs, dating back until 2019. Is there a sense now, as we move ahead, that that around your team that you guys can make a, another run at this thing and and try to go back to the back here? There is a sense of that, but only really developed in the past month. As you saw, probably firsthand, um, the game we played against Syracuse in February, um, we just weren't a great lacrosse team. We had a lot of really good individual players, and we still do. We just weren't meshing. We hadn't created a united collective front, meaning offensively, we were just too selfish at that point. And we'll, you're right. The ACC, the ACC has never been so strong. This is the the you know, the, the peak of its power, uh, exaggerated because of COVID, with men returning for a fifth year and then the transfers. Um, we only did one transfer, local local guy, Baldensville Zone, uh, Charlie Bertrand. Some of the other ACCs took four or five transfers. Um, but anyways, we all we all got even stronger. And then again, for us, returning two fifth years with Doc Sakin and Jared Connors, what a luxury that is to have two first team All-Americans return. So, you know, but, but then you look at your competition, the ACC, I'm like, oh gosh, they did the same thing, right? You know, and so it is phenomenal, the amount of firepower in this conference this year and for the, probably the next couple of years. But you, to really get to the second part of the question, yeah, we just, we've gotten to the point where I think we can legitimately talk about, you know, NCAA tournament, and getting on a run here because it just, it just, we just weren't there. Uh, you saw us against Syracuse the first time, the first game against UNC, we were down seven and a half times. It's just like, it just, it, we just weren't finding our place on offense in terms of being less selfish and sharing the ball. And as Matt Moore has become more of a facilitator, we've become a dangerous lacrosse team. As Ian Laviano has played more, cutting through the goal, cutting through the crease, and looking for soft spots. And with the way he rides, we become a better lacrosse team. And on the other end of the field, our defense, um, our short stick D midi play continues to improve slowly, not huge steps, but baby steps. And our team defense is gelling. So that's why I can tell you now, yes, I think it's realistic for us to think about, um, you know, having a chance to, to, uh, to, 
to, to make a run in the NCAA tournament. Coach, what kind of message do you sort of give to the team when you are struggling and you say, you, you know, you're not quite meshing and figuring things out to the level that you want to be at and the level you know that you can be at to now having won four of your last five? Well, I will tell you, we let it roll for a couple more weeks longer than normal. And part of that is because of the COVID life we're all living, the restrictions and regulations placed upon all of us with the protocols, I didn't want to have a team with too much structure. I felt like for those couple hours of practice and certainly on game day, could this be where we get to let loose and be creative? And um, unfortunately, we weren't playing great lacrosse that way. <laughs> and, you know, there's a reason, you know, I have the title of coach before my name. I'm paid to coach. And um, as a staff, once once we got past that um, that first North Carolina game and we're 0-2 in the ACC, we just decided we, we got to provide more structure. And, uh, and it might be more limiting than the individuals would like, but we got to come together. So to answer your question, Owen, we just sort of said, okay, fellas, we've got to create structure and we're going to restrict some of the things we do offensively and how free flowing we are in transition. The hope is that we restrict this for a few weeks and then we start clicking and then we start playing better. We start playing as a unit and then we can kind of loosen things up. We can, you know, uh, take away some of the regulations and, and let you flow and get to that creative self that we all want you guys to be. So going into the Notre Dame game, that was, we, we were very structured, much more structured than we like to be. I mean, we went in going to Notre Dame game saying, let's play a 66 game. That's Notre Dame strength, but we just, we just weren't flowing. Like I keep using that word. So now the last few weeks, we are starting to play a much higher level game. And so, so yeah. So to answer your question was, it's like, all right, we gotta, we gotta unfortunately constrict here before we kind of unleash. Coach, I wanted to ask about someone who you alluded to a few minutes ago, and that's Charlie Bertrand, one of the few new faces on this year's team. Two goals against Syracuse when you guys played last time out. What sort of allowed him to come in from Merrimack and, and transition into this attack so easily, both whether that be on the field with, with his size and his skill or off the field, just, just as an upperclassman leader? Yeah, I will tell you off the field first. It was phenomenal. We have a uh, leadership committee we call the Saver Committee, which is the three, two or three captains, and then two members of each class, the first years, the second years, the third years, as we call freshmen, sophomores, and juniors here at UVA. And a month into the school year in, in October, uh, the captains came to me and said, can we add Charlie Bertrand to the Saver Committee? I'm like, crap, he just got here. I'm like, yeah, coach, but every time we're talking about issues and sitting around uh, the house or the locker room, he, he's got really great ideas. And it makes sense because he's a two-time captain at Merrimack, you know? And so he's been a leader and he's dealt with issues just in a different locker room. And he has really good insight and wisdom. So right, right there was a proof that this is a man who is someone who's going to help us off the field and with directing the team. Um, and so just a really, really strong character, great man, high GPA in engineering at Merrimack. So um, he's been phenomenal for us for, as a program in terms of leadership. And then the on the field skills are much more evident when you see how many goals he scored at Merrimack. He's a big foul physical presence. And he's got great hands. You know, he just had three goals against Duke, uh, almost a fourth goal if he doesn't land in the crease, right? And uh, in the goal mouth. And he's, uh, so he can dodge for himself. He's a tough cover. And that's really what he gives us is another weapon when Matt Moore you know, needs to, he draws most teams' best defender. Connor Schellenberger, a young guy, he's very dynamic. He draws a lot of attention. Doc Saken, the All-American. Um, Peyton Cormier, who's got such a good goal scorer and can do some dodging as we dodged him late in the game against Duke to try to win the game. And then there's all of a sudden another guy, Charlie Bertrand. And so the challenge for us really has been to, is to get Charlie enough playing time. He needs to play as much as possible uh, the issue is, as I was mentioning earlier, with Ian, Ian Laviano being on the field makes us better. Our depth chart was saying Charlie's better than him. But in terms of our chemistry and flow, we needed, we didn't need another ball carrier. We needed another cutter. And 
you know, someone who's a fantastic lacrosse player, but doesn't need the ball in a stick to dodge. And that's what Ian provides for us. And, and so Charlie's a little bit of the odd man left out. So that's why we're playing him at midfield, which is not his normal position. He's a, he's a fantastic attackman and a really good goal scorer. And so we're, we're still trying to mesh this in. Luckily, Charlie brings with him such a team first attitude and open mind that it hasn't been a problem where it, where it certainly could have been with uh, in the locker room. And then the follow up to that is, you know, was was there sort of a sense that that you guys missed out on this guy, not 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 having him be on your radar a little bit earlier? I know, obviously, he didn't get a ton of D1 looks coming out of high school. And then when he then when the news comes down that he does hit that transfer portal, you mentioned he's a local guy. Were there any rumblings that perhaps you'd be competing with another ACC team in Syracuse in the mix in terms of bringing him in this offseason? Absolutely. We thought for sure everybody would be going after him. And, and I do know he receives some interest from other ACCs. Uh, I'm not sure about Syracuse, but uh, um, it, it's, it's funny. The, the first go around, I was, a coaching, I was coaching in Providence, Rhode Island at Brown University. We didn't recruit him. And that's where I'm really kicking myself in the butt because he's a very strong student. And, um, you know, he tries to make me feel better when I talk about it with him because he's like, coach, I was into hockey. I was more into hockey. I'm like, yeah, but, you know, at some point you must have flipped to lacrosse and I probably still had a couple of admission spots left. And, uh, and uh, we just, you know, we just didn't go after him. And, and um, was he a late bloomer? Or was he just overlooked? I don't know. But, man, it's he's, um, you know, and obviously the NFL has the Tom Brady example. You know, you just wonder how – how do how do elite players like this develop when you're doing you think you're doing your job and other people your competitors are doing their job and we all missed them in the Ivy League and we all missed them in ECC so it's um but yeah we're, when he came around the second time I was like we are not making this mistake uh, again and so uh, just fortunate that we have a great um, academic program that he's interested in. we're a, a one year master's program in commerce here that's really really highly rated at University of Virginia. And again, because of his strength as a 3.9 GPA undergrad in mechanical engineering, he wanted an elite program. And so we were fortunate to have that for him. And, and, and that was it. We just wanted one transfer. We lost Michael Krause, an All-American left-handed attacking for us. He decided to not pursue a fifth year, that he had a great job in New York City. His girlfriend was moving to New York City. He wanted to, to, to take that next step in his life. So we went out and found someone to, you know, similar skills replace him in a sense and that was it we we like our identity we like who we are we're not big into taking a lot of transfers but you know we're also not going to ignore charlie Berger. coach i wanted to talk a little bit about the face-offs here the first time you squared off with syracuse the orange were were pretty much in control throughout the game in terms of that statistical category but uh there has been a, a recent shift in terms of syracuse's success and I believe it's Anish Shroff has been saying that a lot of people took notice to some early movement. Is that something that that you noticed that first time that that Syracuse played? And is that something that has really been sort of the kryptonite for Syracuse in terms of the faceoffs ever since that's been pointed out? There's no question. Uh, Jacob Falb got the best of us. I mean, we only saw Falb, I, I believe. He took a, every faceoff for Syracuse. And and, um, and Petey had his worst day. Petey LaSala is... Uh, you know, he's one of the best lacrosse players in the country, period. I mean, PD not only can gain possession, but he plays offense. You know, the North Carolina game, PD's behind the goal, and we're throwing him the ball behind the goal, not just carrying back there. I mean, we're, we're treating him like Michael Sowers. Like, hey, all right, you can catch the ball at X and, you know, do your little, uh, you know, the little dance move and get yourself, get your hands free and make some feeds. And, um, but yeah, in terms of possession, boy, Fal had him. And sometimes somebody has someone's number, you know, a little, batter pitcher combination you know or some some sort of yeah, somebody just just really gets somebody so that's the challenge for us Saturday is can Petey get back to you know can, can Petey assert himself like he has against most of the best face-off men you know Petey did a nice job against Gallagher from Notre Dame uh, did really well against Naso from Duke uh, Carolina's got two very good face-off men and we've played them twice and Petey's been two-thirds successful time so um you know, for, for PD, this is an opportunity to show that he's improved and learned. Um, now, the challenge, as you just mentioned, in, is if you get to Falp and you beat him, but, but, but then there's Varela. 
And, um, and so he's, uh, you know, and then now they're playing Savage as well. So they've got more than one, whereas we've really just been leaning on one. And so we put a lot of pressure on Petey. And, and so, uh, yeah, so we've definitely studied that film the first time we played to see what Falp was doing um, and to see why he was so successful. And, um, um, and so it's, uh, it's going to be a, uh, it's going to be, it's going to be key. I mean, when we lose by 10 goals to Syracuse the first time, we have to do, a, you know, Syracuse played really well and we didn't play well. And one of those areas was the faceoff backs. And uh, so getting, uh, getting that to 50% or higher is certainly going to be key for us. Coach, the news comes down this week that Syracuse is going to be without one of their leading goal scorers and Chase Scanlon uh, suspended indefinitely for the time being. For, from an approach standpoint for you guys, how does that now change things? Obviously, it's one less prolific goal scorer to have to deal with. But but where does that that attention sort of get redistributed on your end? Right. It's, um, you know, it's, it's would you rather know what you're going to get, even if it's more ferocious and tougher to defend <laughs> versus the unknown. Um, I remember the first time we played Syracuse, about 20 minutes beforehand, we realized that Owen Hiltz was starting. That was his first start. And I'll tell you, it, it threw me off. I just, I, uh, I hadn't prepared for that as much as I should have. And um, so we spent the next 10 minutes like scrambling. Okay, what's the matchups? What, what do we do with the matchups? You know, we, uh, <laughs> we liked it when Owen Hills was a second line midfielder, <laughs> you know, he's a, he's a heck of a lacrosse player. And so now here we are. And again, like going into it, like, okay, who's going to replace Chase? You know, Chase is a fabulous lacrosse player. I got to know Chase um, as an assistant coach of the Iroquois Nationals and uh, working with Mark Burnham um, on a, on with the uh, Iroquois Nationals in Israel for the last world games. And, and uh, Chase by far was the youngest player on our team, but he held his own. He was, he played some midfield for us, took some face offs. He's a great lacrosse player. So to not have him out there certainly hurt Syracuse. Um, but Syracuse has Owen Seabold. They have Griffin Cook. They've got other really talented offensive players. And you combine them with that first midfield and the way Rafis and Hiltz are playing. So uh, the, 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 there's certainly going to be a miss of Chase Scanlon, but it's, um, as we were talking about earlier with the ACC this year, there's so much more firepower than ever before. And, um, you know, I don't want you to take, you know, Ian Laviano away from us, but we, we have someone we can insert there and I'm sure they don't want to lose to Chase Scanlon. I just, I just hope that, um, you know, Chase and Tahoka Nanakoke, you know, for me as someone who grew up with the Onondaga people and um, has worked with the Iroquois for most, much of my life, and then certainly specifically with the World Games in, in Israel. It's really disappointing that two of the men that I was fortunate to coach with, uh, Tahoka and Chase, are not in the college game, you know, as we round out the, the regular season and going into the NCAA tournament. And that's, that's frustrating. It's frustrating. And I just kind of wonder what, what the rest of us can do for them or what they obviously got to do for themselves and, you know, make better decisions. But it's, um, that's a frustration for me as an aside, as I look at the bigger picture of how we're playing the game that Native Americans gave us, how do we get more Native Americans and keep more Native Americans playing this game? We've had fantastic role models, for example, the Thompsons and, and uh, the Powellists is back in their day and Gawa Schindler. And there's been some incredible, incredible players. And um, we're just, there's just not as, there's not enough right now. We need more. I'll, I'll turn it on you. Is there a, a way that we can help? Is there a way that we can work to expand in terms of bringing more Native American players into the college cross scene? Or is that just a more difficult fix than me asking for you to give the, uh, the 60 <laughs> second way to fix it? Yeah, the 60 second fixes are easy, right? Because then we, we turn off the computer or turn off the Zoom and go back to our normal jobs, right? It's, it, it takes hands-on approach, getting in the communities, um, first of all, it's, it starts with the education and really, really hammering home the importance of receiving a post high school education and the, you know, per, it being sincerely interested in pursuing an advanced degree. Um, and so it starts there. Um, you know, but the rest of us, you know, ensuring that if they do, if we do receive um, students of Native American background, to our campuses that it's going to be quite alien it could be very different and even at a syracuse or albany you're still you know a couple hours from home 
much less if you're Virginia and Charlottesville, where you're eight hours from home. And you know the community setting, the, the matriarchal societies of most tribes, it, it really tight. It's very cohesive. And to step away from that is um, can be scary and unnerving, and 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 sometimes, you know, looked down upon by others in your community. Um, you know, not so much as you know, staying in the Syracuse, Albany area, but you know, maybe going too far away from home. So, um, you know, with Zed Williams, who was a fantastic player here, he he had to deal with that a bit. So he he stuck it out. Um, Dom Starge always told some you know funny but true stories like. You know, if the semester started, uh, you know, September 1, uh, Zed Williams rolled in uh, August 31st around 8 or 9 p.m. You know, he squeezed as much time as he could with his family and friends, you know, and and then he arrived as late as possible. But he, he was there for four years, got his degree and, and did it. So it's possible. Just we need to provide support. Um, it starts with education and um, um but, but yeah, there's, I wish it was an easier answer. We've talked a lot about this. We've talked about, do we start up lacrosse camps to identify 13, 14, 15 year olds, boys and girls, to make sure that they're learning right then the importance of their freshman year grades and sophomore year grades in high school and the importance of taking the SAT more than once. Um, you know, but again, it's the values. Is, is the college education a value? For some, it's not. Um, you know, Audie Stotts, fantastic lacrosse player, made the all-world team in 2018 in Israel. Lyle Thompson didn't make the all-world team. Audie Stotts does. Audie goes to OCC for a year and not really into it. And, and that doesn't have to be for everybody. But I'm just wondering if we can make it, you know, uh, how, how we can get into them earlier and help support them on this path. Um, and, uh, and it's not just the finances. It's, it's really some of these other things that are more institutionalized. But, Anyways, it's um, something we, we talk about and think about, but I wonder if we can do more about. Coach, last one for me here as, as we bring it back to a little more of the X's and O's. You know, the, the last time you guys did face off against Syracuse, you look at the box score and Tucker Dordovic finished with three, Brendan Curry finished with three goals as well. But it's a first line midfield of, of Trimboli, Dordovic and Curry that – has played well in their own right, but maybe hasn't lived up to all the hype that, that that some people expected coming into the year. And that second line of middies really progressing and seem seeming to be getting better with every game as well. Are you surprised in any sense that, you know, it, it's not Trimboli and Dordovic necessarily headlining this Syracuse bunch? Is that more a product of opposing defenses like yourself, just making it a point to drape guys all over them as much as possible, or, or has something gone wrong there for, for that trio, you think? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't attribute Syracuse's losses to the first midfield. I, um, you know, I think they're fantastic. I do agree with you. The second midfield has, has played well enough that they, they've deserved and earned their playing time. Now, it's interesting with Scanlon out, does Siebold or Cook go into that spot? And so does that, does that reduce, you know, how much the time the second line will play? And so will we then get more of a heavier dose of uh, Dordovich, Curry, and Tromboli? That's what we're assuming. Um, so, um, you know, I just, you know, as we've seen the face-offs, the, the, the face-offs, uh, you know, they certainly beat us up. But since then, they just haven't had the ball as much. Um, looking at that Notre Dame game where Gallagher was was dominant, and then North Carolina had the possession a decent amount. Though it was it was fairly close in the 50-50 in the North Carolina game, but there was just some turnovers soon after they won the possessions for, for the Syracuse faceoff men. So I um, I'm unfortunately quite confident that if that first midfield line gets enough touches and enough possessions, they're going to score enough goals because we've certainly experienced that. We've been the other hand of that. And it's just too talented. I mean, Curry is so fast and such a good vision and such a good feeder. Dordovich is, it's next level, that change of direction. When he comes out of that roll dodge shooting, um, it's its next level. And Triboli is such a nice compliment player. You know, the way he cuts off ball and he can dodge for himself and shooting from the outside. So, um, yeah, the, to, there's no question off. This is the best first midfield line in the country. Um, and um, so I... Um, yeah, I, I have uh, a lot of confidence that they get enough touches. They're they're going to get theirs. 
Coach, one final question for you. Before this season, every single matchup between you and Syracuse mm -hmm. in terms of your time at Virginia has been a one goal game. Is there a favorite moment from, from those matchups that, that stands out the most to you? Um, and, and what can you just sort of say about when Syracuse and Virginia, and at this point, I feel like I ask a rephrased version of this question to every ACC uh, opponent's coach, because all of these ACC conference games have been so close, but what do you sort of approach when it comes to Syracuse and Virginia, and, and what does that game sort of mean to you, especially with the Central New York background? Yeah, it's it's always been very special for me. I, 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 I literally pinch myself that I get to be a part of this competition, this, this rivalry. You know, having gone to Brown and coached at Brown, uh, amongst some other places, Lemoyne for two years, you know, I looked from afar, like, wow, that'd be so cool to be a part of that rivalry, to be a part of where you, you know, essentially you roll the balls out and you, you let it fly, you know, highlighted by the, you know, the, uh, the, the amazing game in 97, it was 22 to 21. I think in 2021, we were trying to recreate that. Unfortunately, you know, you know, uh, Syracuse's defense kept us at 10. We gave up the 20. <laughs> but Syracuse's defense wouldn't let us ha have that 20 to 21 game. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, just it's, you know, we, we got the same colors. Uh, we have the same sort of attitude with playing. Um, you know, there's some coaches that and some programs that are really, really structured. And I admitted to you earlier, we needed to get back to some of that structure midseason because we weren't playing well but now we want to unleash. I think mean, Syracuse is similar. They don't want to have too much structure. Let the players play, have that creativity, let them flourish. And you'll be amazed by what they can do. You know, we saw that for years, you know, when I was growing up, you know, watching the Nelsons and Brad Cotts and Lindblad and then the Gates, obviously with Marichak. Um, and then, uh, and, you know, then it's the Colsey and Carcaterra and, uh, eras and, and just on from there with the Powells. It, it's been, it's, 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 it's the style they play. And, um, and so it, we're just so similar. And so it did make sense that we we're always playing these one goal games and these incredible battles. And, and, um, and unfortunately that didn't happen in February for us because we got our doors blown in, but it's a, um, but I will, I will admit it's special. It's special for me coming home. Um, and, and uh, you know, cause I, I grew up, like I said, bleeding the orange and loving everything that was Syracuse. I can remember uh, the Jim Beheim bringing his basketball team in for dinner in 1981 or 82 and, you know, and um, at the restaurant, I had this huge sheet of paper and I got everybody to sign it, you know, and um, it wasn't Louie and Bowie. It was the guys a couple years after that, like Eddie Moss, um, Sherman, um, Leo Routens. It was just, I mean, I was, I couldn't have been, I couldn't be a happier kid in the, in the planet. You know, this was, this was everything. And so, uh, so I've loved it. I've always, I've always enjoyed uh, um, rooting for Syracuse. I still root for the Syracuse basketball team. I, I probably shouldn't say that out loud, but Tony Bennett across the street here, I, I do root for Virginia when we're playing Syracuse, but you know, in the NCAA tournament, it was like, you know, I was enjoying Syracuse get to the sweet 16, you know, with that zone defense and Bayheim son hitting those shots and, it's it just, I guess I think it because it sends me back to being a kid, you know, and, uh, you know, and that's always fun. I mean, it's, that's an amazing thing, too. I was seven years old, I think, when Bayham became the head coach. And when I started watching basketball, <laughs> I'm 52 years old and he's still coaching basketball at Syracuse. <laughs> the continuity is may probably help help keep that bond there. And um, so it's a um, yeah, it's, it's we're we're expecting um, obviously another battle, you know, a, a, a team that's you know, um, that's going to come down here confident because they beat us up the first time. And um, and so we're looking forward to this uh, here at Clockner Stadium. Coach, thank you so much for the time this morning. And we, uh, we wish you the best of luck uh, this weekend. All right. Thank you, Owen. Thank you, Johnny. Enjoy the time. Again.